Welcome back, y'all. Um, my name is Annie Simpson. I'm an artist and Doctor of Design student here at the GSD. I quickly want to shout out that my interest in participating today and my interest in Olmsted as a subject comes directly from Sarah Zodi. Um, and being able to learn from her and my fellow students here at the GSD. Without giving too much away, what struck me most during my time spent with each of these texts over the past week was how, in a certain sense, they each upended any commitment to the idea of the campus or the unsettlement or even the collective as a fixed spatial or ideological form and instead position them as active and contested processes. And I understand that this observation may sound a bit banal to landscape architects or theorists, but I want to offer a point of commonality. Like any artist practicing after the conceptual turn, issues of process are always already at the fore for us as well. In the context of this panel, what remains at the fore is displacement. To cut across a constellation of definitions, we are looking at what has been displaced, maybe why it has been displaced, and how this process of displacement can perhaps call into question the idea of the campus or settlement as a fixed and naturalized form. Whether via, as we will all soon learn together, the displacement or misplacement of plans and visions, the displacement of symmetry for the picturesque, the displacement of water and soil via erosion, and of course, the material discursive practices leading to the forced displacement of Seneca Village and its residents. I'm gonna stop here and let these presentations unravel those threads. And as a side note, anybody who correctly tallies how many times I've said displacement in the last minute gets a free lunch tomorrow. Um, so my fellow passenger travelers through campuses, collectives, and unsettlements include Yvonne Ellett, Christine Edstrom O'Hara, and Alexander Manovitz. Yvonne Ellett focuses her research on intermedial designs for art, architecture, landscape, and urbanism. She received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, and a BS from Yale. Ellett is a professor of art at Vassar. She's been a visiting professor at the universities of Bologna and Urbino, and a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin. Christine Edstrom O'Hara is professor in landscape architecture at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, with research that focuses on landscape history and historic preservation. She holds degrees from Stanford University in English, a master's in landscape architecture and preservation planning from the University of Washington, and a PhD in landscape architecture from the University of Edinburgh. Alexander Manovitz is a scholar, public historian, and consultant on the histories of freedom, race, and urban development in the United States, with a particular focus on New York City and Seneca Village. He is currently an assistant professor of history at Baruch College, City University of New York, and has previously held visiting faculty and postdoctoral positions at the New York Historical Society, the New School, and Trinity College since completing his PhD from NYU in 2016. Biographies of more length can, of course, be found on the GSD website. Um, and I suppose we should begin. Thank you, Annie. And my thanks to, um, especially to Ed Eigen, um, as well as to the team of Paige, Kat, Samantha, and Matt for uh, conceiving and orchestrating this event, which I'm delighted to be part of. I'm also indebted to colleagues at Fairstead, the Library of Congress, and at Vassar, as I'll refer to these archives, with special thanks to Michelle Clark at Fairstead. The Olmsted firm has long been recognized as one of the foremost creative forces in American campus planning. 
They worked with over 150 schools at various stages and in different modes, projects that contributed to the firm's success as well as to the American educational landscape. But if the bicentennial has prompted many institutions to trumpet their Olmsted connections, research often reveals rather complex narratives of Olmsted involvement. In 1905, John Charles Olmsted, then head of the firm and one of America's leading campus designers, wrote to George Parker, superintendent of Keeney Park in Hartford, lamenting the limitations of the firm's influence on campus design, saying, quote, it's almost impossible to make a definitive plan for the continued development of such a college, he was speaking of Vassar, which already has many buildings and presumably insufficient land for a comprehensive plan. Of course, we are able to do our best work in advising colleges when we're in at the start, as was the case with Stanford, Washington University, American University, Lawrenceville School, the Groton School, and a few others. Up to the present time, we've given advice of some sort, usually merely preliminary reports for over 60 colleges, universities, and endowed schools. I think these colleges ought to consult us whenever any new building or other similarly important change in existing conditions is contemplated, but while some college professors seem to grasp this idea, they usually, I suppose, are unable to secure the approval of trustees to the necessary expenditure." Close quote. For example, a 1909 Olmsted report to Lafayette College in eastern Pennsylvania decries how buildings had been added promiscuously over time, resulting in building arrangements that were, quote, not so admirable, close quote. This situation in part reflects the iterative nature of campus planning and growth that we all know well by ever-changing protagonists, often untutored as patrons of architecture and landscape. And it's often been particularly acute for small institutions of modest means, which lack a design program or a university landscape architect. Vassar and Lafayette were far from alone in having only sporadic contact with the Olmsted firm or selectively adapting their advice. What can such institutions that did not originate as Olmsted plans in whole cloth reveal about the firm as a shaper of educational institutions? The Olmsted's campus planning has long been overshadowed by attention to their work in other spheres. Studies of their campus designs are comparatively few and scattered, and synthetic studies are scant. I make no claim to a synoptic view, but my case study of their multi-generational recommendations at Vassar piqued my interest in some broader issues their campus work raises that are ripe for further study. Gendered design, attitudes to boundaries, the use of native or exotic plantings, the form and function of the campus arboretum, and the place of formal design. So I turn to these today, starting with an overview of their work at Vassar. The firm consulted there at three formative stages for the college, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux in 1868, John Charles Olmsted, or JCO, in 1896, and Percival Gallagher from 1929 to 32, followed very briefly by James Dawson the next year. However, the history of Vassar's early campus design has long been uncertain. In 1871, a decade after the college's founding is the first institution to offer women an education equal to that of men, Scribner's Monthly ran a long story in which it described the campus landscape studded with gems of loveliness and declared that, quote, a third of 200 acres is laid out and planned with a view to ornament after a plan from Messrs. Olmsted and Vox, close quote. Olmsted Sr. and Vox visited the campus on August 3rd of 1868. The next day, Olmsted wrote to his wife Mary, mentioning Vassar only to say, they have a miserable plan to be amended, that's all. <laughs> this presumably reflected his distaste for the seminary-style large single building remote from the so-called civilizing effects of town, elements that Vassar's founders had deemed desirable for the protection of young women. And Vassar's main building, which originally housed the entire institution, was indeed then among the country's largest structures. The surrounding landscape was probably designed by founder Matthew Vassar and the building's architects, Thomas Teft, then James Renwick. Early marketing imagery depicts a scenic pastoral setting, while photos reveal a bleaker landscape dotted with conifers. The flat central area of campus had previously been a racetrack, cleared of all vegetation, although it was surrounded by creeks, ravines, farmland, and woods, affording a range of landscapes, once home to the Muncie Lenape. Tensions between formal and informal design had been endemic to this campus from its outset. 
Matthew Vassar had worked closely with Andrew Jackson Downing for the designs of Springside, his ornamental farm in Poughkeepsie, and had absorbed Downing's ideas about the beautiful and the picturesque, although Downing died too early to have been involved with the college directly. Vassar also admired formal French architecture and gardens, and he and Renwick debated the merits of an axial or winding approach to the monumental main building. The axial approach won out, so that is what Olmsted and Vox saw. Just three days after their visit, Vassar trustees recorded that the partners had made an outline sketch for improvements to roads and paths. No trace of it has been found, despite searches from 1896 to the present, and no evidence beyond the Scribner's encomium suggests that any changes were undertaken to the campus as a result. Perhaps the college actually owed some long lost landscape gems to their ideas. More likely, early accounts of the campus contributions were exaggerated to become legend. In any case, it's clear that the elder Olmsted and Vox did not lay out the campus. Three decades later, in 1896, when the college was poised for a major expansion, they again invited him to campus, but given his declining health and recent retirement, it was JCO, a partner since 1884 and then running the firm, who came instead. He wrote a 15-page report in which he clearly articulated what he calls the, quote, principles and rules governing convenience and design, close quote, explaining how they could be applied to the college's particular circumstances. He recommended that Vassar rationally allocate land in the central campus for a growing nucleus of what he called working buildings, recitation rooms, assembly halls, and labs, with a peripheral zone designated for residential buildings. He proposed placing working buildings on either side of the axial main drive to form an imposing architectural group about a quadrangle. And he produced no drawings to accompany this report, uh, a fact that I confirmed by examining the firm's comprehensive plans index, or PI cards. But instead, he evidently sketched the placement of the proposed new buildings on a topographical map provided by the college, distinguishing working buildings in green and residential structures in red. And Vassar, Vassar did indeed realize classroom buildings, library, and chapel to frame the central quadrangle. However, they placed the building slightly farther apart than JCO had recommended, making it a giant greensward divided in two by the axial drive and the overgrown evergreens lining it. The trustees decreed these lawns must be protected from any further buildings to preserve the formal symmetry and quadrangular effect, which the college has basically maintained. JCO also opined on the siting of new dorms, voicing his ideas about gendered design. He noted, quote, the desirability of a somewhat greater degree of domesticity and privacy in a women's college than one for men, close quote. This privacy, he asserted, required that women's dorms be spaced further apart than men's and that they should be laid out differently too, not in stiff and formal quadrangles, but arranged in a quincunx or echelon plan, a pattern best known from 19th century hospitals and asylums configured uh, with staggered wings, which shared with dorms the needs to provide light and fresh air for many residents with central supervision. But Vassar disregarded this suggestion for practical rather than gendered reasons, instead configuring the dorms around a quadrangle adjacent to the main one. So the college followed JCO's proposals in significant ways, but not fully. As they did on other occasions, they sought the opinion of consulting art landscape architects, but made the decisions locally. I became curious about the changing valences of the quadrangle and a formal design in the Olmsted's campus work. In his study of American campus design, Paul Turner traces a chronology from Oxbridge-inspired quadrangular campuses to FLO's park-like campuses for land-grant institutions, characterizing it as a progression from elitist to democratic values. The firm's so-called formal campus design phase is sometimes attributed to JCO and to turn of the century Beaux-Arts style following the 1893 Chicago Universal Exposition. But the division in the Olmsted campus of does not seem so neat. FLO was indeed outspoken at times about his preference for informal designs for campuses, notably for Berkeley and Cornell in the 1860s, when he said, quote, don't, I beg of you, begin by tying yourself to formality and straight lacing of a straight quadrangular system. Instead, recommending a more free, liberal, picturesque, and convenient organization. 
And yet, FLO himself worked with formal, formal rectangular spaces, for example, at Stanford in 1888 and at Columbia in an 1893 plan. So do we interpret a campus quadrangle as another element in the so-called hot fight between the formal and natural garden styles, which came to a head around the turn of the 20th century? Or can we nuance the formal informal binary in campus design? The 1909 Olmsted Report to Lafayette offers some ideas on this point. It was written by JCO, I believe, or at least reflected his ideas. It states that, quote, there are two fundamental principles of design which should be kept in mind in planning college grounds, namely formality and informality, close quote. He distinguishes formality in buildings, characterized by symmetrical plans, and in grounds via walks, drives, and plantings. He advocates pairing formal buildings with formal grounds and vice versa, further recommending formality for working buildings and informality for cottages and other small buildings. He declares that it's easier for most minds to grasp formal ideas and to arrive at good design along formal lines. Yet he notes that landscape architects, unlike their architect peers, often favor informal landscape based on their appreciation of natural topography and also their awareness of grading costs. He concludes that for a school that already had many buildings, it would be impractical to impose either design method consistently, as might be done on a new campus, but rather recommends considering each element based on local conditions. The goal is, quote, to have a reasonable degree of formality in the immediate vicinity of each formal building. So there are degrees of formality. But to carefully avoid formality further from the buildings where the slopes and trees are distinctly informal and natural. There's no evidence that he gave that advice to Vassar, but that's actually how the campus developed. JCO's central quadrangle established a formal sector of working buildings, which, along with the dorm quad, would be complemented by an informal schema in the surrounding zones, following the topography of hillocks, hollows, and streams. And it was after the addition of these sectors that the college again turned to the Olmsted firm. Meanwhile, in the three decades following JCO's involvement, Vassar had cycled through a succession of consulting landscape architects, notably Samuel Parsons Jr., Loring Underwood, and Beatrix Ferrand. After parting ways with Ferrand in 1929, with JCO by then dead, Vassar contacted FLO Jr., who handed off the request to his partner, Percival Gallagher. At that time, Gallagher was also involved at Bryn Mawr and at Duke and the Harvard Business School, as Gary Hildebrand has discussed in one of the few, if not the only, publication to date on Gallagher's interesting work. And I'd like to thank here my former student, Caleb Mitchell, who contributed research on Gallagher's Vassar work. Gallagher initially spent two days at Vassar, where he took photos to record circulation, plantings, and views between buildings. 38 Olmsted firm plans survived from his tenure as consulting landscape architect to the college, along with a wealth of documents. We glimpse the firm's collaboration in these materials. Gallagher's hand is preserved in field notes, study notes, and planting notes, as well as sketches and informal notes to colleagues. PI cards reveal that the plans were then drawn by 12 different members of the firm. Aldrich, Blaney, Blundell, Graham, Millard, Mosley, Phillips, Rando, Sloat, Sullivan, Town, and Walsh. Gallagher worked on several new outlying sectors of campus, including a 75-acre parcel here around uh, a giant new building, which you see here uh, in the detailed topographical survey of Eastern Campus that he directed. The new building was sited on a bluff behind which the land sloped steeply uh, down to the Casper Kill Creek. And Gallagher wrote about how to harmonize the new building's function with the latent landscape beauty of this valley, valley and the problem of circulation across it. He proposed a service road for this sector along the route from the back entrance of campus, looping up to the building, and then to the power plant. And it was partially realized. Gallagher also worked on grading and laying out walkways among the buildings in this sector, which would artfully follow the, the topography, as in this beautifully drawn uh, uh, drawing by Mosley, who also drew the associated cross sections and profiles that accompanied detail calculations. Gallagher sketched his planting ideas for the zone onto a topographical map, as you see here. Um, which his associates then transformed into a formal planting plan, specifying a hedge of Japanese flowering quince, 
uh, around the building here, a lilac collection, uh, and other spring flowering shrubs and trees, which were each keyed into a long planting list. Another of Gallagher's projects focused on the new Bell Skinner Hall of Music, for which he made many uh, sketches to improve traffic circulation for the drop-off and parking at the concert hall and for plantings um, here, all of which uh, are extant. The building had been sited on a large section of the ecological garden uh, or laboratory of native plants to Dutchess County. A project of Edith Roberts, the pioneering plant ecologist and proponent of native species, then chair and professor of botany. Her ecological lab grew to comprise over 600 species of plants, nearly all the plants of the county, in their natural environmental associations. This unique resource led to the 1929 publication with Elsa Raymond of American Plants for American Gardens, the important early manifesto on ecologically based landscape design. Roberts, Raymond, and Ferrand were all at Vassar in the mid to late 20s when Ferrand initiated the Arboretum. The college was also promoting landscape architecture as a major and career for women, engaging Harvard's Henry Frost, founder and director of the Cambridge School, to speak about landscape architecture as a field for modern girls. So at the time, Vassar was a crossroads for new landscape ideas. Yet the president, Henry McCracken, and the groundskeeper, Q-trained horticulturist Henry Downer, were not always on board. Archival documents suggest that Downer had a problem working with women, notably Ferrand, whose ouster he engineered, and also Roberts. At Skinner Hall, the trustees gave Downer control of the area within a 30-foot radius of the new building, thereby setting up a conflict between Downer and Roberts. And into this thicket stepped Percival Gallagher. He deftly, deftly mediated between them, proposing to plant only natives around the building to harmonize with Robert's surrounding garden, and urging the college to allow her to control more of that area, but also noting that new construction called for adjustments and re recommended removing some large native plants in her lab to improve building views. A path was cut through her laboratory to the building, uh, and a bridge added over the creek. You see it here, looking toward the back of the building. Downer proposed it, Gallagher approved and proposed plantings to edge it, and Collins, the building's architect, weighed in on its curve. Downer took a dig at Roberts by writing in the alumni magazine that this path would open the way to, quote, tame another rough area and create a proper setting for such a handsome building. So an interesting clash of opinions on the value and decorum of landscape and in relation to architecture. Gallagher also worked closely with Downer to develop new areas of the Arboretum, advising on the selection and siting of species. And again, a divisive issue was whether to privilege natives, as Roberts and Farron championed, but which Downer and the trustees did not fully support, and McCracken dismissed as a fad. The Arboretum's function and scope were also contested. Farron had conceived it as a campus-wide vehicle for the propagation of trees and shrubs for practical, educational, and aesthetic reasons. Like Roberts, she viewed it as an outdoor classroom and arranged for the Arnold Arboretum to donate many plants and seeds. But Downer McCracken and the trustees took a narrower view. Gallagher, after discussions with Downer, issued a report recommending a restricted selection of plants, chosen primarily for ornamental rather than botanical interest, and limited its footprint to open sites on moist ground unsuitable for building. His report evidently reflects the trustees' wishes rather than a theoretical ideas about the potential of a campus arboretum. It seems that whereas Ferrand took a strong stand on the subject, which contributed to her ouster, Gallagher read the room, picked his battles, and did the best possible within the client's directives. He was known for his modest, unassuming manner and lack of ego, despite his creative talent, artistry, horticultural knowledge, and erudition making it difficult to suss out his own ideas at times. Vassar also tasked Gallagher with designing a wall to replace a dying hedge along a campus boundary for which he supplied these drawings that remained unexecuted. Protection of women had been a priority at the college from the outset, although they had not erected a hardscape enclosure around it. They had previously invited fence designs from Ferrand, who gave drawings for forged Swedish iron atop stone or brick walls with the figure of a woman sketched in facing outward through the bars, which was surely an editorial comment. 
the desirability of firm campus planning, uh, uh, campus boundaries, has cycled in and out of fashion. Gary Hildebrand has noticed that a sense of security and protection was the most popular design trend for American campuses in the first three decades of the 20th century, in contrast to today's fuzzy boundaries and open and inclusive campus, uh, campuses that embrace community. Many of Gallagher's Vassar proposals remained unexecuted, though they laid the groundwork for later development, and some paths and many plantings he recommended are still part of the campus arboretum today. Subsequently, campus development has continued under a succession of landscape architects who've incorporated new buildings, recast connections among them, and renewed plantings. The Olmstead's projects for Vassar at different stages of campus development and on different sectors represent a broad range of the firm's campus consulting activities. The recommendations of JCO and Gallagher were starkly different in tone and substance, and yet certain fundamental Olmstead principles informed their plans in each era. Principles bulls that could be flexibly applied based on site, program, and institutional constraints as they explained and demonstrated. If we can read Olmsted campus principles and ideas more clearly at institutions where they had a freer hand and at the outset, we can also see their creativity, flexibility, and pragmatism in these piecemeal consulting projects, characteristic of campus development. This history of their campus interventions reveals contested and shifting lenses on the aesthetics, decorum, and utility of landscape elements, from fences to native planting and quadrangular lawns, which is interesting as we reconsider the value systems embodied in the campus landscapes we inhabit and how to steward, renew, and expand them in this Olmsted anniversary year of ecological crisis. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Ed, too, for inviting a really large variety of lenses in order to examine um, Olmsted this year. So my lecture is called Still Chasing Water, Frederick Law Olmsted Theory and Practice in the Arid West. Water affects all things in the landscape. In California, water has been and remains a critical concern in development. We know that water and plants are related, but ironically, water is closely linked to fires. The more precipitation in a given year, the higher the grass grows. During the fire season, these taller grasses cause more devastating fires. Working with water also means working with topography and drainage. In places like California, after major fires have burned away protective vegetation that mitigate erosion, Heavy winter rains have felled communities, as it did in Montecito, Malibu, and Lake Arrowhead, to list only a few. Designing with a clear understanding of the ecological conditions of a site not only makes the design feel of that place, but it also may be a matter of life and death. In most of the United States, weather patterns include year-round rainfall, like we've been experiencing the last, last couple of days, such that planners can design with expectation of regular water resources. During the 19th century, city boosters in California heralded cities without rain in what was invent an invented climate in many ways. More truthfully, many parts of California have a Mediterranean climate, such that rain falls from October through April with little to no precipitation during the remainder of the year. This creates both the problem of no insufficient amounts of water for half of the year, and sometimes torrential flooding during winter storms. Meteorologists have noted prolonged and extreme droughts as part of California's natural ecology, with cyclical occurrences from the mid-1800s to today. While 21 inches of annual rainfall is typical for most cities like San Francisco, Drought years have ranged from desperately low annual rainfall of four to six inches. How do we design for this predictable range of weather? One can argue that impacts on water management was a result of choices made 100 years ago. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson sponsored an expedition for Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to travel west across the American continent mapping the landscape into a series of neat 90-degree grids to create democratic division of land. While egalitarian, geometric land division ignored hydrology patterns across the arid regions. 
Nearly 70 years later, Civil War hero Major John Wesley Powell successfully navigated the length of the Colorado River from the headwaters to its end near Moab, Utah. Later called the father of reclamation, Powell explored the Green and Colorado Rivers and redrew state boundaries for the regions for what he believed matched watersheds rather than grids, ensuring a ready water supply for the American West population. Powell argued that the Jeffersonian model would not succeed outside of eastern boundaries, with his map providing a more ecological approach to western development to ensure adequate water supply. Powell's work was aligned with the U.S. Reclamation Service, which had been established in 1902 to study potential water developments in western American states. The service's approach was a momentous change in ideology in that humans could engineer any natural system to their own needs, especially water. Named after then-President Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt Dam on the Salt River in Arizona was the first in a series of large dams to be built to secure water for irrigation projects. This era of dam building in the early 20th century instilled that water could be conquered and controlled in arid regions in early 20th century um, America through modern engineering, and thus we could confidently mitigate for both drought and flooding. Today, all of the America West's large rivers are dammed with highly managed and controlled surface water. With that context, Frederick Law Olmsted was living in California during the devastating drought of the 1860s and realized the challenges of landscape design in the region. He later advised his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., that the future of their firm would be in developing a new and original landscape style that would deal with the problems of the arid west. In an era of debate about water management and conservation of natural resources, Olmsted foresaw the enormous pressures for growth in the West and anticipated that an advancement in landscape architecture theory and practice would require different models from those developed across other parts of the country with year-round precipitation. For California, those designed landscapes would require a shift in their practice because of the difference in climate. Olmsted's built and unbuilt projects in the Bay Area of California, including Mountain View Cemetery, Stanford University, and a system of pleasure grounds in San Francisco, are significant, and he was one of the, only a handful of practitioners interested in regionalism as ecological design, predating the 20th century's awakening of natural resource protection. As Victoria Rainey writes about Olmsted's designs in California in 1864 to 1866, his quote, isolation on the California frontier in a separation for two years from the institutions, people, and scenery that he knew well, caused him to create the first designs for a college campus, an urban park system, and a scenic reservation. For the rest of his long career, Olmsted continued to develop the forms of landscape architecture he pioneered in California. This paper will focus on three case studies that work with the environment and were especially sensitive to water. In collaboration with Calvert Vox, Mountain View Cemetery was Olmsted's first landscape in California. The city of Oakland had outgrown its two small and sightly graveyards in the center of town. Having passed the Rural Cemetery Act in 1859, and in the tradition of Boston's Mount Auburn, Oakland's professional leaders and businessmen resolved to establish a garden cemetery for Oakland in the nearby countryside. They bought the two miles uh, land north of the town, incorporated a cemetery association, and named the site Mountain View. By September 1864, the cemetery trustees ordered a topographical survey to be sent to Frederick Law Olmsted with the design response related in a March 1865 report. With this project, he was eager to tackle the challenging site as he wrote that, quote, for some time, he wanted to try his hand at a rural cemetery on the order of Spring Grove in Cincinnati. Frederick Law Olmsted carefully studied the Bay Area's dry summer landscape and the site's topography with the planned layout of curvilinear roads due to the steep slopes. While drawing ideas from eastern cemeteries he admired, Olmsted Sr. wanted his design to be a fresh approach that captured the region. In California, he argued, design must be different than on the east coast and work with the existing ecological conditions of Oakland Cemetery site. Olmsted objected to the artificiality of simply mimicking design from other regions, such as England or the Atlantic coast, 
with vastly different soils, climates, and rainfall. Noting the regional climate, he wrote in this report, scarcely anywhere in the world except in actual deserts is the indigenous vegetation so limited in variety as it is in the country about San Francisco. It is subject to long continued rains and to flowing torrents of surface water at one season. It becomes dry and powdery, withering vegetation at another. While Olmsted enjoyed the lush verdure of the mountainous meadows at Yosemite near where he, was, he had been living, he didn't like the aesthetic of a dusty yellow treeless landscape in the Bay Area. At Mountain View Cemetery, his plan was to focus on small areas and plant them with evergreen and drought tolerant vegetation to picturesquely cover the ground and forest the hills with trees to add greenery and shade. Interestingly, while this was an aesthetic choice, it also was an ecological one in that it would reduce erosion on the cemetery's steep slopes. For Oakland, he recommended Italian cypress, cedar of Lebanon, stone pine, Monterey pine, and native oaks as the few species that would survive the windy site, have low water needs, but also be symbolically representative within a burial ground. The drawing he included in the report showed the design of the main avenue of burial plots and how lushly the trees would fill the landscape. With headstones laid flat in the lower portion of the cemetery, the use of lawn heavily characterized his plan as an organizational feature that brought unity and visual coherence to the cemetery. The lawns at Mountain View Cemetery, however, would not resemble turf lawns in other locales due to the region's low rainfall. Olmsted's design used the unirrigated native grass landscape, coupled with Mediterranean-based trees suited to the conditions to develop his new approach to rural cemetery design in California. His ideas were to design in an entirely new way and was in keeping with the concerns about regional design and the major issue of water use in the American West. Olmsted's 1866 design for a system of pleasure grounds in San Francisco was a radical plan, both for its time, but also would be considered radical today. San Francisco's Board of Supervisors requested he propose a park design on par with New York Central Park. However, due to lack of water, Olmsted rejected the idea of a pastoral park in the city and proposed instead a series of public spaces linked by a sunken promenade for pedestrians, carriages, and equestrians. Using Jeffersonian planning, Olmsted noted that San Francisco had been developed without regard to its topography with its gridded street layouts. The soils in San Francisco were sandy, and Olmsted didn't believe that turf or shade trees would thrive under these conditions. Irrigation would need to be limited for a city with low supply, and the city periodically suffered from fire, such that the pleasure grounds could become an urban fire break. Additionally, San Francisco often has cold wind and fog. The design would mitigate for all these ecological challenges in one without precedent, his first concept of a park system. Laura Wood Roper notes that it would be, quote, the first time his principles of landscape architecture would be for a climate not adapted to the English landscape style. A series of spaces would be extended from the west in the high point of what is now Buena Vista Park, which is up in, up in this direction, up in here. So you can see it right there. Um, and then it would have a series of curvilinear carriage roads, ornamental water features, and a small lawn. Midway down the slope, Olmsted located a terrace and overlook with a proposed formal layout of parterres and stone parapets. This terrace would look down to a flatter area where he located the parade and the playgrounds. These were aligned with Market Street. Replatting the street map, bridges replaced existing streets and continued with the promenade that would then go north up Van Ness Avenue to Fort Mason um, at San Francisco Bay. These maps also show the future uh, location of Golden Gate Park in this green triangle that's located here with the panhandle of it extending into Olmsted's proposed plan. In his reports to the supervisors, Olmsted did not call the design a park, but a pleasure ground, emphasizing its different aesthetic. In, discuss in discussing the design, he aptly used the metaphor of a dry creek crossing the city. Speaking to its issues of water shortage, he wrote, the stream that formed the creek became divided, leaving the bed dry. A road with broad walks was in the middle of the old road. To mitigate for the cold winds, he chose a location in the city which was wind protected on the northwest and southeast sides by hills 
and where the soil was moist even during the driest periods. Excavating down 20 feet, the park would look like a dry creek bed, 390 feet wide with a promenade and ornamental grounds at the bottom. The slopes would be vegetated by shrubs and trees with hardy evergreens on the top of the banks, the city screen from the pleasure grounds below. Water hydrants would be placed at intervals at the street level for irrigation and keeping down the dust. While the promenade and parade grounds were rectangular to work with the existing topography, his paths in the hills would curve with the topography. There would be some lawn, but much less than parks in the Northeast. His plant palette mixed exotic plants easily found at nurseries at the time, but he also proposed transplanting California natives from the canyons of the coast range. To reduce irrigation, the slopes allowed for stormwater capture. As Olmsted noted, much less water would be required to keep the plants on the slopes in flourishing conditions than would be needed if they were on the open ground. And the water would be distributed with much greater rapidity and economy. Unfortunately, this vision of new park design was too revolutionary for San Francisco's leaders and was rejected in favor of a more traditional idea of a park. 20 years later, after Mountain View Cemetery and San Francisco's Pleasure Grounds proposal, in 1886, former California Governor Leland Stanford commissioned Olmsted to design a new university on the grounds of his ranch in Palo Alto on the San Francisco Peninsula. In honor of their only son, who had died in the 1880s at age 15, Mr. and Mrs. Stanford decided to build a major university for the state of California. Arriving in the fall of 1886 with his partner, Henry Codman, and his son, Frederick Jr., site selection was recommended on the foothills where there was a commanding view of the Bay and Mountains. Stanford's emotional attachment to the project, however, argued for the lower flat site where Leland Jr. had ridden his horse. In a letter to Stanford in November 1886, Olmsted explained his regional design principles for the project, one that repeated his earlier approach in the 1860s. He observed that people generally desire to duplicate what they are accustomed to, especially when it came to designing new communities, but that the region required adaptation to an entirely new climate. Explaining to Stanford, he argued that one must not look to Oxford or Cambridge and duplicate them, recommending that one should look to Syria, Greece, Italy, and Spain, where the climate was similar. According to Charles Beveridge, for the designs in California, Olmsted drew from his memory of Italy in 1856, before he began his landscape career, and observations later during a two-week return visit in 1878. He sent Charles Eliot and Henry Codman back to that region to find examples to follow. Olmsted also studied photographs of Spanish gardens. Combining his earlier experiences, by 1890, Olmsted developed a four-part plan for his approach to the region, ultimately utilizing all these ideas at Stanford. He would fully cover the ground seen at close view, which would normally be covered by turf in more humid climates. In heavily used areas and in front of the buildings, he would lushly plant where it would be easy to maintain and water. Arranging the foregrounds of views through raised and dense planting, the middle distance would be obscured, so as not appear to be dusty and dry. He would also plant so that the buildings, terraces, and other architectural elements would be lushly covered with vines, focusing on plants needing little water, and thus achieving a picturesque connection of natural and built elements. A series of depressed panels were graded in front of the central buildings in monumental arch, which we can see in, in here. Um, the lower grade was a way to avoid screening the architecture. Shrubs requiring little water were to be used to create a dense foreground of foliage. While Olmsted noted that the usual practice is planting turf for these areas, lawn would require profuse irrigation, and though he didn't include this in the letter, would also require year-round maintenance when there is no snow. Olmsted's vision drew heavily from the Mediterranean, looking to regional architecture in the plan and the general character of the buildings. Single-story buildings surrounded an enclosed central court. Views from classrooms focused into the inner courtyard with a series of arcades uniting the space and providing shade. The layout at Stanford was rigidly formal, but the subtle scale expressed both the scarcity of water and relationship of the buildings to the landscape. The buildings and paving at Stanford were constructed with local San Jose sandstone 
that blended into the yellow of the surrounding grass landscape. Unusual to most American university campuses at the time was the hardscape, which limited irrigation to small planted areas in the main courtyard, in stark contrast to the Victorian approach of an eclectic mix of plants set within large lawns. Trying to model a fitting plant palette for the region, Olmsted planned to develop an arboretum of plants representative of California and other similar climates. Olmsted's ideas for Stanford University were only partially constructed. In a contentious battle between client and designer, Olmsted eventually won with the inner courtyard lar largely paved with eight 55-foot-wide wa circular planters highlighted by palms in their centers. However, at the front entrance to the quad, lawn was added rather than drought-tolerant plants, with Stanford writing, quote, I should be better pleased not to have the excavations made in front of the buildings, as we shall have plenty of water to keep the place green. Not remembering the issue with winter rain, these turf, is, er, these turf areas would regularly flood. Stanford University showed a new approach for design that set a precedent for the Olmsted firm and their later work. It was a celebration of California's ecology with its layout, plant choices, and materials that connected the site, the landscape, and its architecture. To what ideas do we remain dedicated in the year of Olmsted's bicentennial? Water is not only a key political issue, who gets it and for what use, but a natural resource that is precious in the semi-arid West. When we compare what was built in California, we can see the stark differences from Olmsted's conservation of resources. Rather than have the yellow hills at Mountain View Cemetery, the 19th century Oakland community built three reservoirs to keep the lawns green. Rather than the pleasure grounds in San Francisco, the city leaders advocated for one large park, Golden Gate Park, which has struggled from its onset with having enough water to irrigate it and keep it green. Van Ness Avenue was the spine of Olmsted's pleasure grounds design, partially intended as a fire break. Laura Wood Roper points out that 40 years later, that due to the closely built city blocks, Van Ness Avenue was dynamited as a last desperate resort to stop the fires in 1906 after a major earthquake, where perhaps a park might have mitigated them. Olmsted's designs were more than for the genius of place. It was ecological regionalism that helped conserve natural and regional identity. It balanced human use with ecological concerns. What have we learned as yet today? We are still chasing water. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for having me. The morning session was awesome. I learned a lot. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. I also want to thank, in particular, Annie for chairing our session, my co-panelists for getting us um, to a great conversation already, Edward for inviting me. I'll admit most of the unsolicited emails I get through my website try to get me to invest in cryptocurrency. And as far as scams go, this is a really great one. So thank you for having me. Um, and thank you also to Samantha Page, Kat Chavez, and Paige Johnson for all of the logistical support, as well as Matthew Smith for making sure I know how to click through my slides and all that stuff. Um, so as we'll see this weekend, Frederick Law Olmsted was a man with as many careers as perspectives we've shared already about him and more. But despite the many facets of his work and legacy, I think we can generally agree and have already discussed the ways in which he's most well known as a landscape architect. And in particular, um, you know, I know I'm a New Yorker in Boston, so I might get myself into trouble here. But in particular, his work on Central Park, which we can see here on this map um, from 1857, and then a more recent image in all its glory. I'm going to talk about, I'm very impressed with myself for getting that arrow to move. I'm not a design person, so thank you very much for letting me be here anyway. Um, but I'm, I tell you, sorry. Um, there's no shortage of work. Today I'm going to talk about Seneca Village, a community displaced um, right kind of underneath where that arrow is. That's why it's there. But today I'm going to talk about um, 
perhaps a different version of park building or a different aspect of park building. We may already be familiar with the endless volumes on the intricacies of the physical labor and design of building a park, any park, but a place like Central Park in particular, from the engineering feats of the sunken transverse roads to you know the handrail carvings on the way down to Bethesda Fountain. But I'd like us today to think about another version, something I call social destruction. Uh, the processes by which public audiences, city dwellers, and neighborhoods are taught to believe that people and communities are suitable and dis deserving of displacement even before the first appearance of a shovel or, bur or bulldozer. Understanding this phenomenon and how it contributed to the construction of Central Park gives us an epistemology of displacement that is a sense of how ideas of displacement form. In the 19th century, through the 20th century, quote unquote, urban renewals, and of course, in its continued legacies today, as we see it in the face of displacement, redevelopment, gentrification, and all that too. On that topic, I also just want to take a moment and echo the earlier land acknowledgement, recognizing that we're on traditional land of the Massachusetts, and particularly the ways in which all of our work, all of our scholarship that we've, we've already shared today, and, and the rest that I'm looking forward to learning from, about the way our landscape is built around us is inextricable from histories of displacement, colonialism, race, and power, and that you know includes the very institution in which we're standing, Harvard. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about Seneca Village, which some folks may be familiar with, others might not be, but that's okay. In 1825, a group of free African-American New Yorkers came together to establish Seneca Village an experimental political community in Upper Manhattan dedicated to the personal and racial advancement goals. The neighborhood eventually grew to include about 300 residents of African, German, and Irish descent, though the German and Irish residents come a little bit later in its history, living in one or two story wood framed homes, three churches, had two cemeteries and a school all before the city destroyed them and displaced the residents to build Central Park in 1857. So just to call back to Sarah's presentation on um, graves in parks, the bodies are not moved, just the cemetery sort of markings. Um, because the historical record reflects the inequities of the past, my work relies on piecing together overlooked traces of the community to recover their story, through which we can gain a better understanding of black community building and its uneasy place in a model of urban development that promotes progress for some at the expense of others. Before Seneca Village, there we go. Oh, wrong button. Sorry, folks. Uh, before Seneca Village, founders were active members in important black social and political organizations like the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. You see an image of some founders, not Seneca Village founders, but founders of the church off to the left, as well as the African Society for Mutual Relief, an early mutual aid society founded by black New Yorkers. Here we can also see an image of um, the, dis the maps built uh, or created in part for the creation of the park to figure out whose land needs to be compensated. And in the bottom we see uh, the African, the AME Zion Church, as well as a greenhouse on their land, which I think is pretty phenomenal. At a time when slavery was still legal in New York State and most of the nation, these groups actively promoted a form of black freedom that meant more than emancipation from bondage. And at the heart of their approach were ideas of economic opportunity, stability, self-determination, education, and participation in public life. When Andrew Williams, Epiphany Davis, Charles Treadwell, and James Newton, as well as other founding Seneca villagers, first purchased land in Upper Manhattan from John and Elizabeth Whitehead, they were putting the most innovative version of these ideas into daily practice. And, we might add, writing them into the landscape as best they could. The Whiteheads were, realist, were white real estate prospectors who had only recently acquired a large tract of land that they quickly split up to sell as individual lots. But what the Whitehead saw as an opportunity for a quick profit, Seneca villagers turned into a community built to last. 
The community appears on a handful of topographical maps from the era. Most notably, though, none are designed to capture the community intentionally. It's sort of incidental as part of broader projects. So this is a map of Manhattan from 1836. You see the sort of lower, more densely populated area in dark gray on the southern tip here, as well as the area here where the streets are actually gridded out and cleared. And then, of course, the other, you know, almost 100 or so blocks where the grid is sort of hypothetical in physical reality. And that's where we see Seneca Village um, next to the reservoir, just a smattering of buildings. And here's some of those graveyards. Um, we see it a few years later in 51 and a much lower quality scan, my apologies. Um, but we see that it's grown a little bit and there's even the addition of a new church. And then finally, the most detail we have comes from a topographical survey submitted by Egbert Viel for his proposal, ultimately not the one that's accepted, but his proposal for the land that becomes Central Park. With a little knowledge, and here it is in detail. So just to orient folks, this side, the right side of the screen is the north. With a little knowledge of the community's political foundation and the initial burst of land purchases by the interconnected founders, the spatial organization and geography of the homes, churches, gardens, and cemeteries becomes legible, revealing the intentionality of the community from the start. For instance, Seneca villagers settled in a large patch of arable land high in a rocky plateau, about 10 blocks away from the marshier lands to their south, allowing them to grow food for both themselves and the market. I also want to just share with you, this is a Google Maps image of Tanner Spring. That name comes later in the 19th century, but that's a local spring that's still available. You can still find it today. Um, and here are some recovered uh, shards of pots and jugs that may have been used to carry water from that spring and use that. Um, this is from an archaeological dig in 2011. Now, you may have noticed that the buildings mostly keep to the now familiar grid of New York City. The physical streets had only partially been surveyed, purchased, and cleared that far north, but they were well established in the realm of real estate when Seneca villagers began to acquire the land. Though we may be tempted to read the gridded pattern as a sign of their proprietary, propriety, excuse me, and some were at the time, as we'll see, we should be careful not to accept the logic of the profit-driven market too quickly. What the arrangement of homes does tell us, however, is that Seneca villagers wanted to live together. Perhaps an obvious uh, realization, but important in this context. Each could have found land to buy elsewhere in Upper Manhattan, but they actively decided to organize themselves into a unit with overlapping living, agricultural, and community spaces. This may seem like a simple re revelation, but it's an important indicator of how residents sought to live out the social and political ideals of their urban experiment, especially in the context of recent changes to the New York State Constitution, which multiplied the land requirement for black male voters by five and eliminated it for white male voters. So property ownership becomes a pretty big deal. I mean, it continues to be a big deal, but it changes the ways in which it's a big deal. For a long time, that experiment succeeded. I think because we know it's destroyed, it's often easy to write it off as a failure. But for 30 years, it sort of worked. Black Seneca villagers had higher rates of suffrage, that is voter, uh, voting rates, higher rates of literacy, land ownership, and income than their counterparts in New York's others, predominantly black neighborhoods. They managed their own religious institutions, including one of the very rare, very rare at this time multiracial churches in which black people had a leadership role. They cultivated gardens and they created a long-term stable community from over multiple generations. Rights like suffrage and home ownership were restricted to propertyed residents, but not all re benefits relied on wealth. The community offered owners and boarders alike a respite from the health hazards and racial violence as well as slave catchers that permeated Lower Manhattan, as well as an opportunity to participate in new modes of urban activism. That dynamic, political, powerful version of Seneca Village is what we get by centering them and their perspectives. But most New Yorkers never had a chance to see Seneca Village through the eyes of Seneca villagers. Instead, I'm going to put up a couple quotes as well as some counterpoints here. Instead, we have quotes like this. In September 1857, Park Police Captain Montgomery developed a very different view of the land becoming Central Park when he led what the New York Times called a, quote, party of explorers into a cave discovered while workers cleared away the era's dense, area's dense underbrush. 
Montgomery reportedly found a room with a level floor, apparently laid by human hands and covered with moss, but contained nothing in particular except the skin of a quite large snake. Montgomery and his crew abandoned their expedition when they encountered a very disagreeable odor that pervaded the atmosphere in the cave, which made Montgomery excessively sick and faint. Despite obvious human influence on the space, a large and exceedingly vicious billy goat was the only nearby resident Montgomery could identify. But we see here, from an archaeological thing, right? If we're going to look at these communities from the perspective of these communities, this is a stone foundation. It's a rare stone foundation in these uptown settlements, but you know the fact that it's been uncovered certainly um, speaks, can add some levels to our understanding of a moss-covered floor. Newspapers and official city reports spread accounts like Montgomery's, which portrayed swampy land, squalid living condition, and sickly air, defaming the character of the people who chose to live there. Without firsthand experience of Seneca Village, the average New Yorker had no reason to doubt the many injurious stories published about the area. The social destruction, the public marginalization of life in Seneca Village, went hand in hand with the physical destruction required to build the park. It was a necessary companion to the displacement of Seneca Village and other communities that have followed. Before sending laborers to clear out residences across the future park site, municipal leaders, park, Central Park commissioners, and their allies in the press had to equate people, homes, and gardens with livestock, livestock swamps, and rocks. In just a few years, these accounts banished Seneca villagers to the moral, economic, and environmental dredges of the city in the minds of antebellum New Yorkers, erasing the truth about Seneca Village then and creating historical silences today. Those driving the park project categorized uptown, set uptown settlements as refuse, and in a crucial yet overlooked stage of New York Central Park's reconstruction, pub pu I'm sorry, pushed the public through a conceptual shift that exemplified the social and environmental reordering of early American cities. That work was broader, more intricate, and further reaching than we may have realized, and it became a crucial mechanic in the construction of Central Park and the destruction of Seneca Village. In disseminating these accounts, boosters inadvertently revealed and preserved glimmers of the daily life in the places they sought to marginalize, but certainly did not value them. Drawing on long-standing theories of race, class, disease, um, as well as sort of land and geography, park boosters and urban reformers link the physical conditions of the land to the quality of the people who live there. Criticisms like these repeated the urban anxieties deployed by white middle class reform movements, which were already sweeping American cities. The language of urban reformers and park proponents relied on certain assumptions that privileged relatively new forms of urban real estate capitalism in the social and geographic organization of the city. Those are property, individual homes, differentiated commercial and residential spaces, and as we've already learned today, a carefully controlled version of nature. Early in the park creation process, the Board of Commissioners of Central Park, first led by the mayor of the uh, city, Fernando Wood himself, decried the uptown settlements as, quote, straggling suburbs, which were filthy, squalid, and disgusting. The commissioners claimed that these inhabitants had engaged in occupations which were nuisances in the eyes of the law and forbidden to be carried on so near the city. They lived in wretched hovels half hidden among the rocks where also heaps of cinders, brick bats, pot sherds, and other rubbish were deposited by those who had occasion to remove them from the city. On the other hand, we also see Albro Lyons and Mary Joseph Lyons. He did not live in Seneca Village, but owned land there. They're prominent black activists, founders of various social organizations, you know, here portrayed in a formal portrait, um, you know, sort of in fine clothes and with, you know, nice furniture and literature and things like that. They also ran a boarding house, which doubled as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, another account from the New York Daily Times talks about little one-story shanties, each inhabited by four or five persons, not including the pig and the goat. And indeed, it would be a difficult task to distinguish the geni genus to which they severally belonged, so identified are they in the filth, which is the garb alike of all. But again, one of these displacement maps says a two-story wood frame home, multiple dwellings. Right? We're sort of starting to get the lie here. While the commissioners and newspapers portrayed the squalid living conditions of these marginalized New Yorkers, they also took aim on the land on which they lived. 
It depicted it as unproductive, unhealthy, and unable to sustain respectable residents, in addition to undermining the public's perception of Seneca Village and other settlements, suggesting that their hard scrabble lives were neither sustainable nor worth preserving. These reports created an image of unforgiving land in the middle of Manhattan that could only be rescued by the creation of a great park. And even that would require Herculean efforts of public engineering. talking about the transformation of the lowest and filthiest depths into the gay magnificence and elegant equipages that would rival the Champs-Élysées of Paris and the Corso of Rome. Right? This is about saving the city. This is about elevating the city to on a global stage, um, though one author was slightly less poetic about it and just said, I want to attract capital to the city and retain it here. Central Park would not only transform northern Manhattan to the bourgeois uptown utopia that urban reformers and real estate developers had hoped to hoped for, but it would um, essentially save the city and rebirth it anew. Most reports homogenized all of the people and places in the uptown quote unquote shantydom making it easier to trade in generalizations and stereotypes. But only one article in the New York Daily Times explicitly differentiated Seneca Village briefly among vast general generalizations about the, quote, park dwellers. An exception, certainly not the rule. It described the, quote, Ebon inhabitants of N-word village, they did not uh, self-censor, as a pleasing contrast to the habits and appearances of their dwellings to the Celtic occupants further south. The New York Daily Times picked out Seneca Village for being more pleasing and organized in some ways, but they also emphasized this as a distinctly racialized space. They used, despite the fact that it was a multiracial community, they used the residents' blackness to invoke fears of illness and disorder, contributing to the marginalization of Seneca Village and all black New Yorkers. For many Americans, the antebellum city was simultaneously too distant from the natural world and overrun by it. For, es for every essay longing for the didactic effects of pastoral nature, there was another condemning the incessant hogs and goats of city streets. Developers and reformers dreamed of a modern city where race, class, morality, and nature were carefully controlled. They built Central Park to make that dream a reality. By using familiar tropes, Central Park proponents portrayed all of the land as unoccupied at best and in desperate need of taming at worst setting the stage for a massive redevelopment that would replace unruly nature and the people who live there with carefully controlled urban spaces for elite white recreation that benefited real estate development. Centering Seneca Village in the history of Central Park provides us with a counter narrative to the stories of moral and ecological decay, shedding new light on the various processes, often deceptive, that went into creating the park. While many studies focus on the obvious physical labor of building Central Park, we often overlook the intellectual work, the ways in which park, booster poise, park boosters poisoned public perception of people and communities. Closely examining the labor of eliminating Seneca Village in people's imagination through government reports and through the popular press provides new insight into how urban elites learned, first learned, I would argue, in some ways, to destroy neighborhoods in antebellum America and how those lessons continue to shape the ways we think about displacement, gentrification, and redevelopment today, as well as resistant to it in the form of community building and freedom movements. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, y'all, for such wonderful presentations. Um, before we dive into audience questions and online questions, I have a quick one. Um, Alex, in your presentation, you write that the process of creating public spaces requires defining the public. Um, and I wonder how we might apply that to the other presentations here. Um, Yvonne, can you maybe speak a little bit more about how the Olmsted firm's imaginations of the public at Vassar, an institution for the education of women, affect how they design the space? And if that changed over the three iterations um, 
in which they participated in the planning of Vassar. And then Christy, um, how does the public change when Olmsted is out west? Like certainly, um, you know, the Jeffersonian grid is an object lesson on who is and who is not considered part of a new American public. And yeah, I'm wondering if you encountered any of that in your research, um, but then also maybe tangentially, when he's designing cemeteries, is he considering non-living people as part of his public? Um, and then Alex, if you have any other insights to add to that. You go first. Oh, um, well, I, um, I just want to say, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we talk about public space, we talk about common good. I think, you know, the most valuable follow-up question for a historian is always, well, for who or for whom? Um, and I think when it comes to places like Central Park, the fact, and, and you know, we spoke about the difference, someone in the audience asked about whether these were segregated spaces, I think you did, right, um, last session, and I think, you know, there's a difference. Uh, we have to think, and I think just to echo the comment made in response to that, is that some places are sort of practically segregated even if they're not legally. Um, it's a park in Upper Manhattan where not that many people live except for the people getting kicked out or a couple of vacation homes for people like the mayor um, who all of a sudden now has a park front property basically. Um, so thinking about who the park is really for, how is it meant to be used versus the people who sort of have to pay the price for progress they don't get to participate in or certainly enjoy is sort of one of the animating questions of my work. Thank you, and yeah, I'll add with campuses, the whole subject of um, the campus community is uh, one that has changed so radically over the, the, the kind of the time span that the Olmsteads were working. Um, and the whole notion of campuses as progressive places that embody progressive ideas, uh, where our idea of what constitutes progressive has changed radically over that period, has sort of everything, uh, everything to do with design. Um, the idea of uh, a college like Vassar that was conceived for the education of women, which uh, at, at this, in, in the same modes as, as men was, was radical uh, in, its, in its day. Uh, and yet we were talking uh, uh, almost exclusively about elite, white, uh, Christian, probably Protestant women. So you know, the, the campus community, needless to say, has come um, a very long distance from that. Um, also, you know, in terms of what you con what constitutes public, um, is it the student community? You know, does it uh, obviously it includes faculty, staff, um, administration? But what you know, the relation to the community uh, is a big part uh, of that too. So uh, in uh, not only for the Olmsteads, but for you know, any designer of campuses, the the subject of who you're, of, of, for whom one is designing, has changed really, really quite ra uh, radically, and so it was interesting to see those ideas um, play out. You know, in this case, study through everything from um, from fences to um, uh, enclosures on campus, uh, the, even the whole notion of of protection uh, it can be very, very nuanced. So, uh, yeah, it's a complex. A complex question that plays out in a lot of ways. And then in regards to the Jeffersonian grid as an American type of landscape, I, I think for Olmsted he felt it was a ridiculous way to manage land, especially when it didn't think about the results of what you were doing and breaking it up in an artificial way, in a jurisdictional way that didn't make sense. Um, when you th look at a lot of his projects, for example, I didn't talk about in Mountain View Cemetery, the, the reason that the entrance road comes in and then splits into thirds is it was for different religions. So there was a cemetery for Jewish people, there was a cemetery for Catholic people, cemetery for Protestant people, that they each would have a place that they could um, celebrate that person. So it was a way that he was accommodating many people, I think, in that public space. And he also designed the, the cemetery to be a park. So that lower part of the flatter part of, of uh, Mountain View Cemetery, the headstones are laid down so that when you come in, it's just, today it's just a big, huge lawn. But the intention was that it would be this beautiful place where people could go. It wasn't until you got further up that where it's highly topographic and you've got the views of the bay that you have the crockers and the other wealth of the Bay Area creating these very large mausoleums for themselves at the top. But I think for him, the public, when I think about too, also the San Francisco pleasure grounds, that was meant for the whole city. 
You know, I don't, he doesn't really, he talks about socioeconomic groups blending, not much about racial blending in his work, or maybe um, Ethan knows this better than me, but um, blending at least of people of all classes was part of the intent for these spaces, that everyone was welcome. <laughs> uh, we have an online question. Um, this one is directly to you, Christine, again. Um, do you see that Olmsted's ecological regionalism has influenced modern thought on the subject? Um, and then the question asker references Ian McHarg's Design with Nature, perhaps? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Part of my conclusion was that we haven't addressed it. You know, that there's this um, fantasy that California has all this water, you know, that we take it from LA aqueducts, we take it from wherever we take it from someone else in order to create this subtropical landscape that's always green. Even people like Mulholland, who was the engineer for the LA aqueduct, did it because he felt that the people came to Los Angeles to look at its landscape and its lushness and that we needed that extra water, even though 50% of our water was the landscape. I think there is... Um, a group that, that needs to and is, is choosing to look at his work carefully, especially my work more focuses on the Olmsted brothers, so a little bit later than this, who did do a lot of that um, work about in California, especially when they moved to live there in Palos Verdes and really became residents of California. And for once, begin to experience what does drought look like? You know, what are the people there? What are the issues like cars and things like that that have to be addressed within the landscape design? Um, but that. Um, I, I don't know about Ian McCarg looking at the Olmsted firm, but I think if we do look across the broad spectrum, and Charles was talking about this earlier, you know, talking about history and looking at these layers, you know, and how deeply do we want to go in our site analysis to understand the, the, the words of many of the people whose, whose voices haven't been heard, that that part is going to be necessary in ped pedagogy for landscape architecture especially. Elliot. But honestly, Elliot, what's interesting when you when you go back to the firm is I feel like he was the so he was the science person in that in that partnership. He was the one that was really going deeply. Overlay analysis. Yeah. The over, the McCarge and overlay, overlay analysis. And I felt that he of the the partnership was actually the person that was digging the deepest in terms of understanding the environment or at least this kind of ecosystem idea in the late nineteenth century. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for these beautiful papers. Yeah. Um, Alex, this is directed uh, at you, and I'm sorry if this is a very nerdy question, but I was hoping you could share with the crowd some of the other um, resource, research resources you've been using um, having to do with the court filings uh, with respect to um, claims for people who are dispossessed. And I think that's a fascinating aspect of your research we hear about. That's my kind of nerdy, so thank you. Um, so uh, thank you very much. That's a very uh, specific and generous question for me. Um, I what, what Edward is referring to is in part a lot of my research uses the depositions filed in state court by landowners who are being displaced as part of the Central Park project. That includes Seneca villagers, and it includes people from all 843 plus acres. Um, and so part of my research has been sort of combing through it and finding those depositions. And one of the things that, you know, I argue elsewhere in my book manuscript and an article I've written and stuff like that is that the, just the very conception of what makes land interesting and useful and valuable is different for Seneca villagers. Not to say they're in this sort of like pre-capital mode or whatever. They understand that there's a resale value and they very intentionally engage with the market in part to acquire the land so that they can vote, so they can establish their community, so they can protect their, not just themselves, but also their institutions from displacement. You know, the, the Amy Zion Church, part of the reason it goes uptown is because the public burial ground it had been using in lower Manhattan gets turned into Washington Square Park. So um, they're very aware of the sort of financial and commercial and real estate applications of the marketplace and all of that. And, but at the same time, that very same mechanism is what's sort of coming to destroy them. And so they engage in this language of both 
you know, this is valuable because of the improvements I've made and the value I've spent on the lumber and stuff like that. But they also talk about what they do on it and what it means to them in terms of being there. You know, they use language like permanent home in a way that these other prospectors, folks, prank, frankly, who brag about never having even seen the land they own, right? I bought it for X dollars and I haven't even set foot on it for five years, so there's no way it's worth less. It's like, well, you know, Seneca Village aren't bragging about not even seeing it. They're talking about having been there for 30 years or, you know, they appeal to things. Um, there's one deposition of a church in particular that talks about anything less than $2,000 is a great injustice. Um, whereas the injustice other folks are speaking of is the removal of land from the private real estate market, which means it'll be harder to reinvest whatever they do get from the city. Um, so I think um, those, those have been the closest, part of what makes them so valuable to me is that they are the closest thing we have to Seneca Village describing the community in their own words. They are mostly seen, as I showed you on those topographical maps, sort of on the margins of other people's problems. And um, this is one of the ways I was able to reconstruct their own sense of self sort of indirectly and through the mediated process of a legal system. But um, certainly a lot of their values came through. Thank you for that question. Sarah? This question is for Alex. Um, we know that the decision to locate Central Park, where it is, predates Olmsted's involvement um, in Central Park. Uh, we also know that he felt like there couldn't have been a worse 840 acres on the island of Manhattan to put Central Park, um, and that he generally was very frustrated with the process um, that led to its location, believing that it was um, politically corrupt. Uh, at the same moment, you know, as he's traveling through the South, he actually writes uh, impassionately about the idea of, quote, fair play for the Negro. What I haven't found are references Obstead makes specifically to Seneca Village. I'm curious if you've found any in your work. No, as far as I can tell, remarkably, as involved he's, as he is in the process, um, he doesn't seem to write about them specifically. Um, if anybody has found it, I feel like this is the room to ask, so please certainly let us know. I mean, I'm being serious. It's like, it's such a, it's my whole research process has been sort of about scraps in other places, and so um, I'm very appreciative of that question, but no, I sort of share your frustration there. Um, and, you know, I, I, this may be an opportunity, and I don't want to take too much time away, so I'll do the short version of it, is, you know, I think there's a way in which we sort of have to reckon with the fact that Seneca Village is one of many communities that is displaced. Um, and so I don't necessarily know if it makes sense to say inherently that Olmsted or others sort of targeted them. They didn't build this massive park around displacing five blocks. But I do think it is critical we recognize the ways in which race played a role in both what they sought to do there, their ability to resist their displacement, and what they could do afterwards with the few folks who did get money. And also the risk, right? I mean, for me to get displaced from my home doesn't put me at the mercy of the fugitive slave law. Um, for them, it might in a different way, right? There are anti-abolitionist riots before the draft riots, but also downtown earlier in the 30s um, that Seneca villagers sort of explicitly mentioned as like, ooh, thank God we were out of the way for that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that's sort of the, the long answer, but thank you, great question. So this is a really short question, but some of these projects deal with internments, burial grounds. What is the function of the burial ground in the respective moments that your papers have addressed um, in relation to what we would call today settler colonialism? Mine doesn't really address those issues as much as memorializing people. And so it was a way to create a, a landscape that both honored and symbolized death with the choices of the plants and, and items like that. But I think the two of you could probably better answer that question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the sort of colonialism, the settler aspect is important here. And, and the, you know, the fact that this gridded system that's pushing Manhattan, Manhattanites up the island is the same one being used to displace indigenous people throughout, you know, the Northwest Territories before and then the West from there is really important in the way it sort of transforms space into something fungible and accessible remotely to displace people for sort of commercial and other reasons as well. Um, I think you know, there's a way in which the Seneca villagers are raising money. There's, there's one particular, Sally Wilson, the woman whose two-story frame home I showed you, raised money for 
a replacement burial ground for her the, her church, All Angels Church, a multiracial church, um, that she was buried in. She was actually one of the last black members of the All Angels Church buried in land that they controlled because it was sort of in this window between when um, the church still existed in Seneca Village and therefore was multiracial, and they had established a sort of alternate burial site in Queens where she's buried in an unmarked grave today that I think is actually a parking lot now for what it's worth. Um, but before the church moves to the Upper West Side and is effectively resegregated. Um, so I do think there's aspects of sort of who has access to this land, who is, um, who gets to control their space. I mean, these are all sort of questions of displacement and colonialism as well. Uh, who's, who's dead do we value? Whose bodies are an interments and sort of sacred sites? I mean, we can think about indigenous like repatriation acts and things like that as well in the 70s and forward here. So, certainly a swirling. I guess I'll, I'll expound upon that just because the the cemetery movement comes before the parks movement in American history and cities are also expanding rapidly in the 1820s and 30s because of canals, because of new technology and capital accruing in cities. So I think it's a fascinating question maybe to think more about even if you don't have an answer now just because putting certain bodies in different places in a designed way at a city boundary is it and an expanding sitting boundary is a is an interesting way of dividing land, claiming land, staking identity, and it, and maybe there are edited volumes coming out about this. But I would just um, encourage landscape historians to think more about this underwritten moment in the um, antebellum era of parks and cemeteries, as we're doing at this conference. So thank you. And we have time for one more question in the back, perhaps. Thank you, I have been told to be brief. I will ask my question first and then give a two sentence reason why. The question is, I guess to Alex, is there any marker in Central Park that um, commemorates the Seneca Village? And the reason why I'm asking is, I was a student in public health here but took an amazing forestry course Frederick Law Olmsted was the topic of my paper for that course. I don't remember reading anything about Seneca Village. Thank you. Yes, there is a marker. It's been there um, for about 10, 15 years. But in 2019, this, the uh, Central Park Conservancy just put up a much more elaborate series of markers, essentially a self-guided tour through the park, which is awesome and I highly recommend it. That's my short answer. I have a lot of thoughts on sort of the memory of Seneca Village that we can talk about when I'm not taking time away from my colleagues. But. And that's all for our panel today. Thank you all so much for coming and of course to our wonderful presenters.